Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is our midweek Lenten service, Ash Wednesday. This is March the 6th, 2019. We're happy to have you worshiping with us as we receive the imposition of the ashes. We will meditate on the fact that we are ashes and we'll meditate on our humanity. We are dust and to dust we shall return. However, we have the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior, died on the cross to save us from sins. We welcome you to join us in our service. We welcome you to invite Jesus to become Lord of your life and invite him into your heart. And you can take communion and receive eternal life. What an offer. It's an offer we should not want to refuse because this is an offer for eternal life. St. John's is the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia. Come join us each Wednesday at a pastor preaching service, sermons on the Beatitudes.
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecuted you, and are all kinds of evil against you falsely. Turning to our bulletin to the confession and absolution, I'm given by those who can do so without difficulty to please them. We are dust, and to dust we shall return. But our God is faithful and just. When we confess our sins, He covers us in His righteousness and gives us new hope. Most merciful God, dust is our destiny. We are at pure. We are at war against you and our fellow human beings in what we say, in what we think, and in what we do. We have been left undone the good things you have commanded us to do. We do not deserve the kingdom of heaven. Out of the depths of your perfect grace, please forgive us for the sins we have committed against you and against one another. Wash us clean and turn our rags into white robes so that we will rise from the dust of ashes to the glory of your grace. Our merciful Heavenly Father sent His Son, Jesus, who is righteous, merciful, and pure in heart. He is the one who has, by His cross, made peace between evil sinners and a righteous God. 
Jesus Christ rose from the dust of death to life again, so that we are made to live before God in righteousness and purity. It is by His grace that I ask to you the forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we now sing, Today Your Mercy Calls Us.
for it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And by those who came with that difficulty to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, glory to you, O Lord. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is a kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O you may be seated. A couple of announcements to share with you. First of all, a reminder to set your clock up one hour Saturday night before you go to bed. We begin daylight saving time, so if you don't set your clock up, you'll be coming to church when it's over. So please remember to set your clock up an hour. Also, each week in Sunday's bulletin, you know, during the season of Lent, it is at least a tradition in our church and the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church uh, and some other mainline churches to give up something during Lent. Usually it's food or some kind of favorite activity or whatever. Um, but this year, uh, we're going to challenge you to give up something different each week. So in Sunday's bulletin, that will be the challenge, the Lent challenge of the week. And I can already tell you for this Sunday, it will say the challenge for this week is to give up gossiping. So for a whole week, we're going to try to give up gossiping. Uh, and then the bulletin board out here in the hallway, uh, through the doors there, uh, it will be on the bulletin board as well. So uh, look for that each week. Uh, also next week, we will examine Matthew 5, 13 to 16 where Jesus talks about us being salt and light for the world. Let us now sing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, which is hymn number 886 in your worship. by Charles Wesley in the 1700s. He was one of the founders of the Methodist Church. A very wonderful hymn, Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, written by Charles Wesley.
begin this Lenten sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. Tonight, a sermon is entitled, Blessed Are You. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessings are easy to receive these days. Just sneeze on an airplane and immediately one or two more people will say, Bless you, or Gesundheit, depending on how they grew up. And also, with those two or three blessings, you'll also have several people give you an unfriendly look as they worry about you spreading some germs that they might catch. If you have a cold or allergies, then you receive all kinds of blessings from people every time you sneeze. But beyond this, and even though these blessings don't cost us anything, beyond this, we don't hear blessings very much in society in any other context. And we compare that or contrast that to the Bible. Where in the Bible we see God blessing people all over the place. And his very first blessing comes in the very first chapter of the book of Genesis. Where on the fifth day of creation, God says in Genesis 1, 22, and God, after creating the birds and fish, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. Later on, God blesses Noah. God blesses Abraham and sends him packing to a new land that he knows nothing about. And yet, on as he goes on that journey, having faith in God and being obedient to God, God continues to bless him over and over and over again. And then we come way over to the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, God gives us no less than seven blessings throughout the book. Blessing. The word in the original New Testament, which was written in Greek, is a Greek word, makarios. At the front end of this word, you can hear the word mac, which reminds us of macro. Macro meaning to make large, or to make long. It is the word Jesus uses in the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount, which we just read for our Gospel lesson for this Ash Wednesday. To bless someone is to extend or make great that which one has by giving it to another. Jesus' Beatitudes are not wishes, though. He isn't saying, may you be poor in spirit, may you hunger and thirst after righteousness. Instead, these, he isn't saying these as a wish, but instead these Beatitudes are descriptions of his disciples, including us, as we live and witness to the kingdom. More than that, the Beatitudes are exclamation, even celebration of those who will follow Jesus. It's as if Jesus is saying, how blessed are the meek, how blessed are the peacemakers. Given how early this sermon comes in Jesus' ministry, and the slowness of his disciples to grasp the kingdom, one can only admire Jesus' confidence that the kingdom would take hold in people's lives. On this Ash Wednesday, there are three Beatitudes that especially stand out for us. The first, the second, and the fourth Beatitude. Matthew 5, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 6. The first Beatitude in verse 3 is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now notice, 
Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, not those who are poor economically, not those who are poor intellectually, not those who are poor in status, not those who are poor in possessions, but those who are poor in spirit. So what does that mean? That phrase, poor in spirit, describes someone who recognizes a need for God and His grace. It describes someone who is unattached to the world and find their security in the Lord Jesus Christ and rely on His mercy rather than on their own merits and their material wealth. It also describes someone who acknowledges their moral bounds. As followers of Jesus and as citizens of the United States, we talk about morals and values all the time. We talk about the importance of remaining focused on and continuing to teach the morals and values that our nation began back in the, after the American Revolution and the signing and put into uh, practice the Constitution of the United States. We're always talking about that. We need not, we sh should never leave those morals and values. But the reality is, although those are the morals and values we pass on to our kids and hopefully our kids to uh, their children, None of us abide by those morals and values all the time in our life. All of us are guilty of breaking them at one time or another because we all fall short, all sin, and fall short of the glory of God. So that is why this description of poor in spirit says those who recognize they are morally bankrupt, recognize the fact they cannot fulfill these morals as they should. Somewhere along the line and the values, we break down. And whether it's a big breakdown or just a little teeny weeny breakdown, it's still a breakdown. It's still a sin. So when we're poor in spirit, we recognize we can't earn salvation. We must rely on the Lord Jesus Christ. We come together tonight poor in spirit. That is, we come with nothing to offer God but our sins and our needs. It's just like the old hymn says, just as I am without one blue. Found in Martin Luther's pocket shortly before he died was a scrap paper with several notes scribbled in his own handwriting. Among the notes to himself was this quote, this is true, we are all beggars, in the quote. Now what did Martin Luther mean by that? The phrase, this is true, refers to the gospel, that the gospel is true, that salvation comes from God's love that is so great for us, he sent his only son into the world to suffer and die so that we might live. And so this is true, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the truth for salvation. We are all beggars means that we cannot earn our salvation. That we are just like beggars before God. God is not impressed with our social standing. God is not impressed with, impressed with what families we're descended from. God is not impressed by our amount of material possessions. God is not impressed by how much influence we have. Because one little sin fractures that relationship with God. So we are like beggars, begging for just a morsel of bread to sustain our life. And God heard of us begging. And so he sent us Jesus Christ. To us cross-marked sinners, this very day comes the kingdom with all the grace and forgiveness we need to be blessed. And it's only Jesus who can give this blessing. 
because only Jesus ushered in the kingdom of heaven by emptying himself and taking on the form of a suffering servant for us. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for us. He earned this blessing for us by becoming poor in spirit in our place. His humility took him all the way to the cross. There, on the cross, he preached his greater sermon on the mount. Another blessing, which is especially ours today, this Ash Wednesday, comes with Jesus' second beatitude. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now when we hear that phrase, or that beatitude, we more than likely mostly think of someone who is grieving or mourning over the loss of a loved one, or someone who is grieving or mourning over the results of a natural disaster like what just happened in Alabama, or over a man-made disaster, which we see happen every now and then when a bridge isn't made properly or a building isn't made properly and they collapse. Uh, under their weight due to faulty uh, construction. Maybe it's because the contractor used too cheap of a grade of concrete in order to save money, whatever. But we see man-made disasters as well as natural disasters. And that's what we usually think of. But this is what the word translated as mourn really means. Those who lament the present state of life, weeping for the sins that they commit, as well as the sins of others, and grieving at those times when the saints are persecuted for the faith. It also means to be mourning or having grief over sin and the condition of the world. So that is what Jesus is specifically referring to when he said, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And in this grief, this mourning, we have what is called, through our faith in Jesus, the blessing known as godly grief. This is something that St. Paul reminds us about in his second letter to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, St. Paul says, quote, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. End of quote. So as followers of Jesus Christ, we mourn for the sins we commit in the sinning of the world, but this is a godly grief which brings us to repentance. Repentance then brings us to salvation. And we have no regrets. But if our grief is just worldly grief, grief grieving over what's happened to us in the world or because there's a war going on that's affecting our country or we're uh, hurting for food or whatever, that kind of grief just produces death. Or godly grief produces life. There was a preacher who went to see an old man who was dying. And this old man was very anxious about the condition of his soul. After a few visits by the preacher, the truth dawned on the old man and through repentance and faith, he experienced the joy of forgiveness and the assurance of everlasting life. Just before he died, he said to the preacher, quote, I feel like such a sneak because I've served Satan all my life and only now, at the very end, have I yielded my heart to God. Godly grief. As the man grieved over his sinful life that he had led, following Satan instead of Christ. Now 
being assured that through his repentance, he has that gift of everlasting life. He is joyful and can die in peace, even though he wishes he had yielded much sooner. But such was the thief on the cross. He was a man pretty much like this old man, lived a life of crime, a life of brutality, a life of no regard for other human beings. But as he is dying on the cross, he confesses Jesus, and Jesus promises him paradise. Another way of understanding godly grief is, you may recall a few times in your life when you deeply disappointed your parents, or parent, or grandparents, and or whoever raised you. No doubt you can remember the look on their faces and maybe even some of the words they said to you. The sadness you felt inside was profound. Some people never get over that sadness. The same is true many times over in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Sin is not objective or neutral. I know in today's society tries to convince us that sin is objective. It's whatever you think sin is. And no one has a right to give you a bunch of demands of what sin is and that if you do them then you are in danger of damnation. Or they try to tell us that sin is just part of life and it really has no effect. Well, that is grossly wrong. Sin is not objective. It is not neutral. For when we sin, we deeply disappoint a loving Father and it leaves us sad. It's this godly grief combined with our faith that brings us to repent. In sorrow, we turn from our sin and embrace the cross of Jesus Christ, and we are forgiven. Forgiven for no matter what we have done. We are forgiven. It is not something the devil can take away from us. It's not something the world can take away from us. It's not something an angel can take away from us. Because the forgiveness comes from God through Jesus Christ, and therefore it cannot be changed or taken away. Here again, only Jesus can give us the comfort we need. We have the comfort of our Father's forgiveness because Jesus bought our forgiveness and it cost him dearly. It cost him his own life. This son did not disappoint his father. He took our sin upon himself and died for us. This is why Jesus is the only one who can comfort us in our godly grief. Over sin. And in the third blessing, the third beatitude that comes to us as Ash Wednesday is the fourth beatitude in verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Notice once again, Jesus is not talking about physical things. He does not say, blessed are those who are hungry for food and thirst for drink. He says they are hungry and thirst for righteousness, for a right relationship with God, for a, the ability to be able to stand in the presence of God, not through what they have done, but because of being washed in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is worth noting that this blessing clearly flows from the others before. It is not enough to be humble. It's not enough to be repentant or meek, for that matter, which is the third beatitude, blessed are the meek. No, there's more. 
This beatitude, or this beatitude by itself, would leave us alone with God. Now, being with God is not bad. We want to be with God. But we don't want to be alone. We want to be in a community of others who believe in God. That's the kind of paradox, if that's the right word, of Christianity. It's an individual faith in the sense that you have to believe for yourself. You can't rely on the faith of your grandparents or your parents or your brothers and sisters or your spouse. You must believe in Jesus Christ yourself. But at the same time, it is a faith in which we believe in a community. That we are part of a community of faith. That we are part of a fellowship of faith. And therefore, being with God, we want to also be with others. And this fourth beatitude is telling us, reminding us, that we have a life to live and people with whom to live it. In other words, we do not become a Christian and then withdraw from the world. We do not become a follower of Christ and then break off our relationships. In the early church, there was the belief that in order to be the best Christian you could be, you would go off by yourself and be a hermit. Live by yourself. Have no contact with people. Have no spouse. Have no children. Because all by yourself, you would be less likely to be tempted. And so you would go up by yourself with the scriptures and study the scriptures. I don't know how you ate and drank because you weren't working. You weren't in the city. And some of these hermits went out into deserts and stuff. So I don't know what they, they survived on. But it was a belief by being like that. You had a better chance of salvation. That's not what Jesus told us. He said, we're a flock. We're supposed to be together. And as the church, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Instead, like we'll hear next week, when Jesus talks to us about being salt and light, we are to be the salt and light for the world. The seasoning and the light to show them the right relationship with God. So our hunger and thirst for righteousness reveals in us a deep desire to be right with God and right with one another. In the best-selling nonfiction book in 2008, which was then turned into a movie in 2017, same kind of different as me. If you haven't seen the movie, I would recommend it highly. It's if you have Netflix, it's on Netflix. But it's a story about a husband and wife, and they're having troubles in their relationship. And they start working at a food shelter, uh, or at a shelter during giving out food. And they come in contact with this homeless man named Denver Moore. And as the movie goes along, they begin to develop this relationship with each other. And eventually they help Denver rise out from being homeless to actually being a productive member of society. The sad part of the movie is, after the husband and wife are back together and forgiven each other and are back in love, the wife develops cancer. And by Toward the end of the movie, the wife dies. And at the funeral, Denver Moore, this former homeless sage of wisdom, says in his eulogy of a wife, quote, There's something I learned when I was homeless. Our limitation is God's opportunity. When you get all the way to the end of your rope, and there ain't nothing you can do, that's when God takes over in the world. So it is with our yearning for righteousness. If we try on our own, we will always end up at the end of our road. The righteousness we seek is only a righteousness God can give through Jesus Christ, and it does not come cheap. It costs the life of Jesus.
Jesus Christ on the cross. This is a righteousness of heart which we receive through our faith in Jesus Christ. His perfect righteousness becomes ours as we place our trust in Him. That's one of the definitions of the word to believe. It means to trust in someone. It means to have confidence in them. It means to place your hand, your life in their hands. And that is what we do when we believe in Jesus Christ. We trust Him completely. We have confidence in Him completely. And we take our life and we give it to Him. From His righteousness then flows all of our right decisions, our right relationships, and our right actions, causing us not just to be satisfied, but to be blessed in Christ. As we begin this Lent journey, as we make our way through life, we Christians will look different from the rest of humanity. Our Christ-like humility, our godly grief, and our righteousness of faith make us unique. And these blessings of Christ, we can look at each other and say, you are the same kind of different as me. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You would return to your bulletin. You notice it says prayers, and it says each petition ends with Lord because of your mercy, and you respond, Blessed are we. Let us pray. Lord, because of your mercy, bless. Lord Jesus, we thank you for opening your mouth and teaching us. You have called us blessed, and so we are. Because of your perfect life, your crucifixion on the cross, and your resurrection from the dead, we are blessed beyond all people. Lord, because of your mercy, bless the Lord. Lord Jesus, as your people, you have called us to open our eyes to those who are poor, those who mourn, those who are meek and those who hunger and thirst. Make us merciful, so that we not only see, but also help those who are in need of help. Make us your hands and feet for service in this world. Lord, because of your mercy, bless us. Lord Jesus, you have taught us to be peacemakers. Use us to properly influence our government, to rule according to your will, and in the wisdom only you can provide. Make every leader around the world compassionate and peace-loving. Lord, because of your mercy, bless the Lord. Lord Jesus, you bless your people with the miracle of health and healing. Surround all those who are ill with your presence and your love. Give them the blessing of people who are wise, willing, and ready to serve them in the best possible way for restoration of body and soul. Lord, because of your mercy, Lord Jesus, we thank you for all those who were persecuted for righteousness' sake and have given their lives for the sake of the gospel. We also thank you for those near and dear to us who influenced us in the faith and now live and walk with you. Their reward in heaven is great due to the boundless depth of your grace. Lord, in your mercy, bless us. To your hand, Lord Jesus, we place all our needs, knowing that you are the only one who can bless us in measure beyond our wildest expectation. Amen. Watching the Ash Ministry Service, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We've had the imposition of the ashes. The ashes are made from burning the 
palms from last year's Palm Sunday, and mixing with some oil, and these are the ashes we received on our foreheads with the mark of Jesus' cross on our foreheads. We know that we are ashes and to ashes, that we are dust, and to dust we, we shall return. However, we know that Jesus is our Savior, and He will, when the pastor says we're at the end of our rope, that's when God, God takes over, takes care of us, and we receive eternal life. See the offering now being brought forth, and ushers are bringing the offering to a pastor who was the offering and then place it over on the side of the chancel. Notice we have a new uh, altar cloth, beautiful altar cloth, purple, with the crown of thorns in it. It's a gorgeous altar cloth. You can see that uh, today. The pastor is, is now uh, making ready the elements of Holy Communion. We will now receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We believe that His true body and blood are present and, and in the elements that we received, it's really it's body and blood and not the elements. The elements are now have now become, as Pastor will bless them, become body and blood of Jesus Christ, given for us. When Pastor says the word for you, that's when it takes place, that the elements become his body and blood. That we receive him, he's with us forever. As he blesses us, as Pastor said, blessed are we. And we'll, we'll study now the Beatitudes, this is what we'll study every Wednesday. You can uh, hear your pastor uh, explain what they all mean to us. St. John practices an open communion. For all those who are baptized and believe in Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, we believe his body and blood are truly present as we gather in the state in our communion age and our individual congregation. We invite and encourage to come forward with us this day as we gather at the table for all. We continue with a great thanksgiving on page 152 in the front of your red worship. And I invite those who came without difficulty to please stand. The Lord be with you. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. You may come forward this. given for you. The body of Christ 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 given for you. We have received the true body and blood of Jesus Christ. This is a mystery of faith. Jesus has said, this is my body, and it is true. We believe it, that it is his body. This is my blood. We believe that this is true, that this well, is my blood. This is mystery of faith. We receive his true body and blood, as he said. Body of the Lord Jesus Christ, his precious blood, strength and preserving your true faith until life eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that we, who have received the sacrament of his body and blood, may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. We conclude our worship with the church's one foundation, Hymn number 654 in the back of your worship. Hymn number on the play, page in your bulletin for 654 in the back.
This is the conclusion of our Ash Wednesday service, which has occurred on March the 6th, 2019. <laughs> You've been with us as we received ashes. We We've meditated on the fact that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. We confessed our sins, we received Holy Communion, and through Holy Communion we are united with all those who have gone before us, all the Christians in all time. We will see Jesus face to face, as we have met him face to face at the communion rail this evening, as he, we have received the true body and blood of Jesus Christ. The elements may appear to be just uh, bread and wine, but there we believe, and we, we have believed throughout the time since Jesus instituted this sacrament, this is the true body and blood of Jesus Christ. Come worship with us anytime. We worship on eight, at uh, 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. Be sure to set your clocks forward this so we have the, uh, have, you know, by the time you hear us, here, the time you uh, look at this broadcast, we'll probably be into uh, daylight saving time. But that's what we are doing now. We're going to set the clocks forward. You see now the our, our altar is going to be uh, taken care of by the altar guild. But this is the end of our service. And Jesus Christ, may bless you. Ask that you be blessed through this day and all your coming days. Have you ever seen